Love is like a sunrise Shattering the dark of night Your presence is a paradise To our hearts You're filling all the world with light You're making every wrong thing right And you're waking up the dead to life In your love
Well, hello and welcome to Gracewood Online. We are really grateful that you joined us today. If it's your first time watching and, you know, maybe someone invited you to watch, maybe they texted you or shared a link with you and you clicked on that link, we are thrilled that you would do that. I just want to encourage you, though, this morning not to watch this service alone. But if you happen to be alone right now, that's no judgment. I just want to encourage you to maybe get together with some other people, both today and in the coming weekends. You know, maybe it's some friends, maybe it's another group or your family, perhaps. Uh, maybe even consider hosting like one of those watch parties or something. Because it's not just about the content that you personally receive. What makes this so powerful is the mutual encouragement that we all need from one another. So I just wanted to encourage you and start off by saying, get together with some others as you watch. So today we are continuing in this message series that we've been in now for a few weeks called the Gospel of Luke. And we're going into part four of that series today. And so really what we've been doing is, is really just walking through the Gospel of Luke. And so there are four biographies of Jesus' life and ministry at the beginning of the New Testament. And each one of the authors who wrote those gave their perspective of who Jesus was for very specific reasons. And the most important reason was that we might come to know him better. So. You've got Matthew, who writes for a certain group of people through a certain lens, and so does Mark, John, and Luke. And Timmy previously mentioned this, that Luke is the gospel primarily for skeptics. So, you know, if you've ever had questions, if you've ever been struggling to find some hope, uh, maybe you've ever been, felt like you're on the outside looking in, wondering if you would be included, or if you've ever even wondered how a good God could allow a bad year like 2020, then listen, Luke is the gospel for you. And so Luke talks about the purpose of his writing in the, in the very first few verses where he says this. He says, I've taken the time to put together a well-ordered account. And the reason he did this was so that a friend of his named Theophilus could be certain of the truth of who Jesus is. But you know, that also tells us something about Theophilus. He was troubled. He kind of had an unsettled spirit of some sort, and he had some questions he didn't have answers to. He was looking for some hope. And Luke says, Listen, I want you to come to believe this truth. So that's where we are in the Gospel of Luke. And during this series, what we're doing is we're allowing Luke's words about Jesus to settle our unsettled spirits. Quick story for you. I spent a little over 11 years working at an automotive repair facility, both as an estimator and a production manager. And so part of my job in both of those roles was that I would be dealing with people. And if you've ever dealt with people, well, then you know just how much fun it can be, right? I mean, it can get really awesome at times. And by awesome, I mean incredibly, incredibly difficult. So when I first began dealing with people, and I'm talking about customers and employees, and I was very young at this time, you know, from time to time, there would be instances where problems would arise. And, you know, even though I felt I had a pretty good handle on what needed to be done to fix those problems, in many cases, I just did a really bad job of letting other people know how we were going to fix those problems. And so sometimes, you know, sometimes, maybe not all the time, you had some customers and employees who were not happy with me for that reason. And so this continued for a short while before the owner of the business discovered that, you know, maybe there's a little something going on and we need to talk it over. So at one point he sat me down and and he shared something with me that after some practice and some conscious effort, along with observing his example, which I'm still learning, by the way, was so important for me to begin learning. And that this is what he shared with me, was that people matter. People matter. And I know that sounds sort of like a given, right? Of course people matter. How could you not know that, you might be asking. But, you know, it's easy to lose sight of the fact that people matter sometimes, right? People matter. And what I was doing was putting more importance on the systems of like how we were doing things than I was on people. And I wasn't considering how those people were being affected by the way I was treating them. You know, there's nothing wrong with the systems that we had in place necessarily. The problem was me. And so after I began to put some things in order to get to know the people who I worked with and customers whom we worked for, I began to understand how, how critical it was, not that we fixed a bunch of cars, but how behind each vehicle that we repaired, there were people who were affected, lives. And so this meant that there would be people who would come in 
with all kinds of emotions attached. You know, maybe they've been dealing with an enormous amount of stress that week, just totally stressed out. Or maybe that morning they just had a fight with their spouse or spilled coffee on their clothes or were late for work. You know, whatever it was, on top of having to get their wrecked vehicle repaired, if that wasn't enough. So I had to change my view of the job. And it wasn't for the sake of fixing cars or maintaining profit that I had to do that, although those things were important, but more for the sake of the people who I came into contact with on a daily basis. And you know, it doesn't matter who you are or what you do for a living. You know, it doesn't matter if you own a business or if you work for someone who owns the business. It doesn't matter if you're a stay-at-home mom or a dad or a doctor or a teacher or a plumber. Listen, people matter. People matter to God, and therefore, they should matter to you and me. And here's why. First reason is that God loves people, and He's commanded us to love one another. You know, the second greatest commandment after loving God is loving your neighbor. That's Matthew twenty-two thirty-nine, 39, and you know, that should be enough, right? It should be enough. But here's the second thing. The two most important things on earth, things that would be eternal, are the Word of God and people, right? God's Word will last forever. Isaiah 40, verse 8 talks about that. And then our souls, those are eternal things. And God promises eternal life to those who put their trust in Him. So people matter. Now there's also a problem with that statement, people matter. And it's this, people are also messy. And now some of you are like, amen. I know a lot of messy people. But be careful. <laughs> people are messy, right? People are divisive. People have different opinions can have different perspectives, and people will even hurt you from time to time. So it can be really hard to hold on to that truth that people matter because people can also be the thing in life that can be so painful. But people matter. We need to be reminded of it, both as individuals and as the church, now more than ever because, you know, we live in an environment right now where anxiety is high and morale is just so low. And the place we find ourselves in right now is a place where you know, we have to be physically distant from each other. So that makes relationships and empathy and compassion, makes all those things very hard. And we end up just communicating through like a screen or a keyboard or some sort. It, it kind of dehumanizes us toward one another. But we need to come back to this reality, this truth that, that people really do matter. So as we come to Luke 5, Jesus is going to kind of help reinforce this truth in a very unexpected way. So if you have a Bible or the Bible app on your phone or something, go with me to Luke chapter 5. Starting off in Luke 5, verses 1 through 3, it says this. One day as Jesus was preaching on the shore of the Sea of Galilee, great crowds pressed in on him to listen to the word of God. He noticed two empty boats at the water's edge, for the fishermen had left them and were washing their nets. Stepping into one of the boats, Jesus asked Simon, its owner, to push it out into the water. So he sat in the boat and taught the crowds from there. So I just want you to get the scene here, what's going on. Jesus is on the shore of the Sea of Galilee and he's teaching and a bunch of people showed up. You know, people in the back were kind of having trouble hearing Jesus at that time. And Jesus didn't have a microphone like the one that I'm speaking into right now. So he did the next best thing that he could do. Simon Peter, a fisherman that Jesus knew, had just come in from fishing in the night and his boats were right there. So he borrows one. He, he gets into it and says, hey, push me out just a little bit. Jesus is, at this point, he's sort of using the water of the Sea of Galilee as his PA system. And so he begins to teach the people. So Simon and his fishing business partners had just come in from a long night of fishing and they hadn't caught a single thing. And now if you're just fishing for fun, that would be a real downer. You know, you want to catch fish. But if you're fishing for your livelihood, that's got to be devastating. So they're in a bad mood, and, and here they are, you know, washing their nets. And it's kind of like that scene from the movie Forrest Gump. You guys remember that movie? There's that part where Forrest is out on the shrimping boat with uh, Lieutenant Dan, and they're all excited, and, and they pull up their nets, and, and so what comes out? There's like a tin can, a, a shoe, and a toilet seat, I think. And this sort of is kind of the image that I'm seeing here. You know, Peter and his buddies are sitting there like, we got nothing. And so they're washing their nets. They're in a bad mood. And so it says this in verse four, it says, when he had finished speaking, talking about Jesus, he said to Simon, now go out where it is deeper and let down your nets to catch some fish. 
And you know, what's unusual about this is that Jesus is preaching a sermon and then he sort of all of a sudden just stops. And I don't know if it's because he thought it wasn't a very good sermon or something like that, or maybe what Jesus had been teaching on, he wants to kind of illustrate. And so he sees this as a perfect opportunity. So what he does is he says to Simon, hey, why don't you go out again? Why don't you get in the boat and go out where the water's deeper? And when you do that, let down your nets, those nets you've been cleaning, it's time to get them dirty again. And what happens after that is Peter shows his irritation in his response. So in verse five, it says, Master, Simon replied, we worked hard all last night and didn't catch a thing. So Peter's got sort of this exasperation in his voice. You know, he's irritated, he's tired, he's frustrated. You know, they've been working all night long and he's a professional fisherman. He kind of knows what he's doing. If there's nothing there, there's nothing there, you know. And yet, here they are at the Sea of Galilee, which was chock full of fish. And it was one of the top industries in that part. But they hadn't caught a thing. And so Jesus is asking him to dirty his nets again. And it wasn't a small task to wash nets. These were massive fishing nets. So it's really the last thing that Peter wanted to do. So to add insult to injury, here, here's Jesus, who was not a professional fisherman. And I would imagine that Simon might have had this kind of internal dialogue going on in his mind. Uh, something like, what do you know about fishing, Jesus? You're a carpenter turned teacher. You know, I, I don't come into your shop and tell you how to make tables and chairs, do I? But Simon decides to go ahead and kind of go along with it. So check out what Simon says next. He says, but if you say so, I'll let the nets down again. Now, I've got a question for you. When do you break that phrase out? Actually, let me ask married couples watching. Let me just ask you for a moment. When do you break the phrase out, if you say so? You're probably afraid to say, right? But the answer is most likely that you say it when you're tired of arguing. It's when you're basically tired of having the conversation, whatever it is. It's sort of like sarcasm that's kind of been worked into an insincere agreement of some, of some sort. So I'll give you an example. Maybe two of you are driving, you get lost. He swears that he's not lost. He says, I'm not lost. The reason it's taken us so long to get there is that traffic's so bad. And, and she says, if you say so, that's when you break that phrase out. Okay, so here's Peter. He's like, hey, Jesus, we're not going to catch anything. We're done for the day. I'm a professional. I know what I'm doing. But if you say so, I'm going to go ahead and go out. He kind of reluctantly trusts Jesus with this. And so check out what happens in the next verse, in verse 6. It says, and this time their nets were so full of fish they began to tear. Now, these were heavy industrial nets. This is what they were made for. And these nets didn't just tear, but, but there's so many fish in them that they actually begin to tear. It goes on, it says, a shout for help brought their partners in the other boat, and soon both boats were filled with fish and on the verge of sinking. So you've got nets that are about to tear, you've got these boats that are about to sink, and once again, these boats are made for fishing. They're heavy-duty boats. They don't sink, but they caught so many fish that that was what was happening. And Peter's response to all this, to everything that's going on here, was not necessarily what you might expect. In Luke 5, 8 through 10, it says this. It says, when Simon Peter realized what had happened, he fell to his knees before Jesus and said, O oh Lord, please leave me. I'm such a sinful man. For he was awestruck by the number of fish they had caught, as were the others with him. His partners, James and John, the sons of Zebedee, were also amazed. Now, this is not the response that you'd likely expect, right? You know, I thought about that as I was going over this. I tried to kind of put myself in Simon's position. If this would have been me, I think my response would have been a lot different. It may have been one of a couple things. First, I may have tried to play it off a little bit, you know, to protect my pride. I might have said something along the lines of, that's just beginner's luck, you know? Or, hey, buddy, thanks for the tip, but anybody can get lucky. Something like that. I might have said something like that. Or, you know what? He could have gone the other way. He could have been so ecstatic, so excited and celebrating and so on. Like, Jesus, what are you doing next Tuesday? Can you go out with us fishing again? Because, man, we need another haul like this. That was awesome. But Peter doesn't do any of that. Instead, he falls to his knees, and his first response is to say, Jesus, leave me. I'm a sinful man. And what we see here is a glimpse of Simon's heart. There is a glimpse of real humility and authenticity here. He recognized who he was standing face to face with. Jesus wasn't just another rabbi. He wasn't just another carpenter. 
This was the Son of God, and Simon could see it. And so his response, standing in his presence, was humility. And this right here is a beautiful picture of a particular word that I really don't know how you feel about. But that word is this, repentance. It's repentance. And repentance oftentimes is kind of a scary word, maybe a churchy word it sounds to you. And maybe you're a bit turned off by the word repentance because people oftentimes use it more of a weapon rather than what it's meant to be. But repentance is actually meant to be an invitation. It's an invitation to actually take a load off of you, to lift a load off of you. Here's another story. When my wife, Becca, goes to the grocery store and then gets back to the house, you know, as she pulls into the driveway, there's usually two or three of us that are pretty much ready to go. We've been watching uh, to go out and help her carry in the hall. How many of you can, can relate? You know, a family of seven can yield quite the grocery load, right? And so sometimes the little ones, uh, my younger ones, will want to help with the groceries and, and they'll see me loading up, you know, both arms because, I mean, y'all know, right? You load up both arms. You're only supposed to be like this guy right here. I mean, you're only supposed to take one trip from your car into your house, right? Okay. But anyway, it's good for them to help. So they'll come along, they'll grab a few bags, but, you know, sometimes it's just too much. And so maybe I'll notice and, and I'll, you know, ask Obi, my six-year-old, Hey, buddy, you need some help? And he's like, no, daddy, I've, I've got it. I've got it. I can do it. And after asking a couple times and watching him struggle, I usually end up with another bag or two on the arm before making it into the house to help take the load off of what he's carrying. And so whenever you see that word, repentance, that's what's an invitation to do. It's an invitation to lay down that load that you're carrying. You know, maybe it's that load of shame that you've been carrying around for such a long time. Or maybe it's those words that wounded you deeply and you're just carrying those around all the time. Or that judgment that you feel or that self-condemnation. When God says repent, that is an invitation to you to lay down that load that he doesn't want you to carry anymore. And Jesus would say it very well, so well in fact, in Matthew 11. He would say, come to me all you who are weary and burdened. I am gentle and humble at heart and I will give you rest for your souls. And this is what Simon Peter has just experienced. So Jesus' response to Simon's repentance is awesome. Look at what he says in verses 10 and verses 11. He says, Jesus replied to Simon, don't be afraid. You know, of all the things that Jesus could have said to him, he could have said, it's about time. He could have said, shame on you. You know, he could have said, you need to do some things to get your act together. But no, he says, don't be afraid. I've seen your heart. Thank you for laying that down. Don't be afraid. And then Jesus says to him, from now on, you'll be fishing for people. And he gives him a mission. He gives him a new life direction. And as soon as they landed, they left everything and followed Jesus. Now, what's so great about that is when Jesus sees Simon's heart, when he sees that it's pure, he sees that it's repentant. He says, okay, now I'm ready to use you. I'm ready to use you on a mission. And the mission he gave him was that he wanted him to fish for people now. Okay, so what does this all mean for you and I today? I realize you might be in a place where you may be thinking this. You may be thinking, you know, that's, that's awesome for Simon, but what does that mean for me? You know, does this mean I'm supposed to go quit my job all at once and go right into full-time vocational ministry? Well, no, that's not what that means. In fact, I would say for most of you watching, that's not what this means. Maybe for a few of you, that might be what this means, but not for most of you. But I would say this. If you've given your life to Jesus, here's the first step of application to do with that. It's a reminder that following Jesus is your priority. Okay, it's a reminder that following Jesus is your priority. You know, making money is great, but it's not your priority. You can make all kinds of money and you can still follow Jesus, but following Jesus is your priority. Having status, nothing wrong with that as long as you're still making following Jesus the priority. So it doesn't matter what you do. It doesn't matter who you are or what you do for a living. If Jesus has captured your heart, then you're going to say, I'm not ashamed of Jesus. I'm not ashamed of following after him. He's my priority. And that's what it means for you. Now, I understand that some of you might be watching and you might say in your head, well, you know, that's really easy for you to talk about because that's sort of what you do for a living. You know, you're, you're the one teaching on the other side of the screen. <laughs> or you might be saying, you know, I'm not allowed to talk about religion at work. And to that, I would say this, good. 
because Jesus doesn't want you to talk about religion at work either. And here's why I say that, okay? It's because religion is this. Religion is the effort I give to justify myself to God. And this in every way is toxic, both to your spiritual growth and the development of people around you. Instead, what Jesus has invited us into is a relationship, okay? And there's a difference, and here's the difference. Relationship is the effort Jesus gave to reconcile me back to God. And that is a complete game changer in every way. And Jesus said, says to Peter, I, I want you to go fish for people with that message in mind. So maybe you're hearing this and, and you'd say, you keep using this term fish for people. I do not think it means what you think it means. Little Princess Bride nod there, if you've seen that movie. Okay then, what does fish for people mean? Is Simon supposed to you know, run around and you know, lasso a net over a bunch of people and like drag them to church or something like that? No, that's not what that means. Although that would be very funny to watch. You might agree. But what he's saying is this. He's saying, Simon, the fishing industry used to be your priority. Now people are. And by the way, you can continue to be a fisherman. And later on, Simon would continue fishing. But it wasn't the number of fish he would bring in every day. He recognized that, that through the fishing industry, what he was doing, people were his priority. And that's the application for you and I. It doesn't matter who you are, what you do for a living, what your line of work is. It doesn't matter if you're a stay-at-home mom or dad. It doesn't matter if you're a teacher. It doesn't matter if you're a builder or a plumber or a policeman or whatever. People are our priority because people matter. And you know, you might be tempted to think something like this. Well, yeah, it's easy to say when you have a lot, of co lot in common with those people, but it's even those you don't have a lot in common with. Those people matter too. Listen, we live in an environment right now where we need to be reminded of this, myself included, now more than ever. Because one of the things about this pandemic that's so frustrating and that due to physical dis distancing, it's also distanced our empathy for other people. Do you get that? I mean, do you see that as well? It it's amazing what we'll say to people through a screen or a keyboard that we'd never say to their face. Because face to face, you know, you've got empathy. Fa face to face, you have compassion. Face to face, you can say, hey, we can talk about this. We can talk this out. But over a keyboard, when anxiety is high and morale is low, we'll, so th we'll say things we never say to someone's face. And so especially in this environment, people matter, all kinds of people. They matter more than, than our position. They, they matter more than our preferences. They certainly matter more than our political convictions. Now, I'm not saying that, that those things aren't important. I'm just saying that they should never outrank people. People are the most important thing. So we need to find out what it is in our lives that needs to change to make people the most important thing. You know, to come to a point that we'd say, I'll do anything short of sin to get people to Jesus. In the book of Jude in the Bible, it tells us to, to keep ourselves in God's love, to be merciful to those who doubt and save others by snatching them from the fire. You know, it's this whole idea that we want to be on the front lines and that we need to recognize that there are people who need our love now more than ever before. And can I just say that in the midst of this crisis and this pandemic, it's so easy to lose sight of this because we're tired. I understand. We're tired. We're weary. We're irritated. And it looks a lot like some sleepless fishermen in the Bible, right? But Jesus had to bring their attention back to what he had died for. And what I want to do today is to humbly bring our attention back to that as well. For nearly a year now, this has been one of the most challenging times for us. And I think God is showing us something, that we have fallen asleep to some things that we need to be more aware of. But I also believe the church is going to roar back from, from this thing stronger than ever because you know, we're a city on a hill, a, a light that can't be extinguished. It's who the Bible says we are. And now, right now is the time for us to get stirred up together, for us to make a decision that we're not gonna let the enemy divide us, no way. We're not gonna let the enemy cause us to be fearful, no. Listen, God has not given us a spirit of fear, but a spirit of power, of love, and a sound mind. So we should be running to the front lines with the love and the hope of Jesus Christ because, man, people are hurting right now and they need Jesus. 
And look, I don't see church as this social club or like an extracurricular activity. You know, I believe we are essential to the spiritual, the mental, and even the physical needs of people. But most importantly, we're trying to get people to Jesus. That's what we're trying to do. And that is what is essential. And listen, I am so thankful for digital to be able to do this right here. But it's not a replacement for face-to-face. -face. It never will be. You know, for 2,000 years, one of the defining marks of the church is that it's gathered. It has gathered through dark days and in brighter days. It gathered through famine and persecution and plague. And the coronavirus is a small problem in comparison to that of the sin of humanity and the needs of the people it affects. And so we gather together because there's a Holy Spirit kind of power when that happens. When you gather with other people, you know, you mutually encourage one another. And I believe we can do this. I believe it can be a safe experience, but a great experience, and especially for people who are hurting, people who are far from God and need to know Jesus from right here in our own community even. Now, on the other hand, I also want to acknowledge something, that there might be a number of you watching who are still not ready to come back physically for a number of reasons. And I want you to know we 100% get that. We understand it and we support you. And that's why online is, it's not going to go away, okay? Online's not going to go away. And hopefully online continues to get better. But I want to encourage you to stay engaged online. Don't do online alone. Find someone to maybe do a watch party with or something where you can be mutually encouraged. It's so important. And keep it up until one day when you might be ready to come back. You know, now more than ever, we need to be unified behind the name in the person of Jesus Christ. We need to come together to be that city on the hill and to be light in a dark, dark world. And, and I honestly am very confident that, you know, on the other side of this, we're going to look back and we're going to say things like, you know, God, we, we never want to go through that again, but thank you. Thank you for the way you sustained us. Thank you for your work. Thank you for the lives that you changed during that time. Thank you for the way that you deepened our faith Thank you for what you, you taught us and for what you did during that time. You know, I can't wait for that. So lastly, I just want to say that if there is anybody watching on the other side of the screen and you're saying, you know, I never knew it wasn't a religion. I never really knew it was a relationship instead. I never knew it was like that. Can I just say there is a God who wants to take a load off today? He just wants to take off that baggage you've been wearing for so long. And he wants to give you hope and new life through his son, Jesus. So today, if you would like someone to follow up with you, you know, maybe just to help you walk through what, what those next steps are, maybe an investigating relationship with Jesus, hey, we would love to talk with you. Don't wait to reach out to someone. In fact, you can even do it right now if you want. There will be a link in the chat window uh, or you can chat right there on the side. You can click on it and we'd love to hear from you, to talk to you and to help you understand the next steps you can take. Church, let's remember that people matter. Let's never forget that truth. And let's all learn to share the love we've been shown by such a wonderful savior with the people who are in our lives. Let's pray today. Father, we come to you right now. I thank you so much for the gospel of Luke and what you're teaching us in this gospel. It's a gospel for skeptics because I've been a skeptic and I'm sure there's a skeptic in many of us that says, can, can we really believe this stuff? And so the answer is yes. Yes, we can. So God, I pray today that if there's somebody ready to give their life to you, we celebrate that with them right now, right in this moment. And God, for, for the rest of us who are watching, I ask that you bring our eyes back to where we have drifted from this, uh, from during this crisis, God. And that is that people really do matter. People matter to you, God. They should matter to us. So God, I pray that you would make us fishers of men. I pray that people will be our priority over anything else in our life as we seek to live out the grace that you've given to us so that people might be ready to hear the truth that you provide. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.